Uh, right now, we'd like to welcome Bruce Cameron. There he is. <clears throat> Bruce is the co-founder of Berkshire Global Advisors, and he leads the firm's wealth management practice. He's advised on a wide range of M&A transactions in real estate, mutual fund, and institutional sectors. In his remarks, he'll share an overview of the industry and some insights into today's valuations. Remember, if you have questions, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, and a pop-up will allow you to type in the questions that he'll address at the end. Welcome, Bruce. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here and, and join in, and I enjoyed Warren's remarks. Very uh, insightful. Um, so I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, what's going on in the M&A world. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that back in uh, March and April, I wasn't sure there was gonna be a lot of M&A to talk about at this point in the year, but um, it, the world has evolved fairly quickly and it is um, as robust as we've seen in a long time. So uh, testament to the economy and to the demand for this industry. You know, as, as we look at what's driving uh, a lot of the activity in the marketplace right now, um, there, there are a number of different themes that are going on, uh, but I'd say certainly one that has um, become very prominent over the last few years is the need for scale. And it used to be that firms differentiated themselves based on their expertise, um, you know, that unique special uh, approaches were appreciated when this was largely an institutional world, special managers, people would seek them out and that was kind of part of the game was to find the the, the gem out there that no one else had found. But in a world where um, people are much more sensitive about making sure they don't make mistakes, uh, where um, it perhaps as Warren suggested, the uh, difference between different players is harder to, to find. Uh, people are looking, you know, buyers and investors tend to be looking for things that have all the, all the pieces in place. And so we find, whether it's in the wealth management side, the, the mutual fund side, or the institutional, that scale is becoming more important. And it's, it's useful in terms of having the range of services and capabilities. Uh, you know, so we worked with a, uh, a large multifamily office and, and the founder of that business said, of, of the 10 things we need to do well, we probably do seven very well, but there are three we could improve. I won't tell that to the public, but that's, that's sort of the perspective. And, and he ended up merging with another firm in part because that helped bring those other capabilities. Um, we, we see um, organizations that now need capital uh, in terms of the way they build a business. Historically, this is a business that is capital light. But as you see, some of the institutional players, particularly in the alternative sector, where they're having to put in co-invest capital or seed funds, having capital available is important as well. Um, and then you think about just the, the process of running businesses uh, means that it's necessary to have infrastructure, to have management team, to have compliance regulation and all that is expense and it is sort of a fixed expense in a large extent. And so organizations look to sort of leverage off of that by getting larger. So that the whole need for scale is important. And, and I guess lastly, and probably in my opinion, perhaps most importantly, this is an industry that is incredibly, as we've already um, noted, competitive. And in attracting and retaining people, it is important to have opportunity in these businesses, be able to pay them well, to give them a chance to extend their careers and things like that. And for that, often it is the ability to make sure you're generating enough cash flow to pay those people and, and, and give them a view of how they can keep growing. So that, that's certainly one big aspect of what's going on. We see a demand for alternative products. Um, certainly a number of the uh, larger players have been trying to add on capabilities um, in the alternative world. We see that a lot in, in terms of the real estate sector infrastructure, but, but there are others as well. Um, the, global, the global aspect of the world, uh, perhaps reduced in importance for the last uh, eight or nine months when it's been harder to travel, but Still, that is an aspect as people are trying to make sure that they're able to distribute their product um, or, or generate capital from investors in, in multiple markets. And so we see a, a number of organizations looking to get access to uh, whether it's investment capabilities or investor base uh, in different markets. And then one of the last things, um, certainly not the least, is the whole technology aspect of the market and, and way that's um, been evolving. And, whether it's, it ranges from 
being able to add overlay capabilities or specialty investment products. Um, you think about you know, the, the recent merger with um, Morgan Stanley and Eaton Vance, and part of the argument is that they were looking for what Parametric brought to bear there in terms of their overlay capabilities. And that's that's born out of some of the technology that, that Parametric had been developing over time. You know, the ability to diver, um, deliver um, products um, or investment services through tech-enabled platforms. Uh, we find a lot of the distribution players are focused more in their tech stack now as a way to differentiate themselves and, and their distribution force. So there's a range of different aspects here, but certainly um, we find that all those things are, are causing people to look at acquisitions as a way to accomplish some of their goals. So let's see if I can get this to switch. So then the next um, slide gives you a little bit of a sense of sort of the history of what's going on from our view in, in terms of the, the market and going back to 2007. And, a couple of things you might take away from this. We, we view it as there were certain themes at points in time um, over the last 10 years or so. Uh, it certainly, uh, there was a, an era of during the financial crisis back in 2008 and 9 of, of some players sort of coming together and, and going through difficult periods. Um, you think about the, the acquisition of uh, Barclays Global by BlackRock was in sort of result of that downturn in the market. Um, and then as people started to try and expand geographically, but I think what you might take away from this as well is it's been a fairly consistent level of activity in the marketplace. Um, in any given year, we may have slightly more or less, the, the assets sort of moving can vary particularly if there's a, a large transaction, but uh, it's a fairly active and consistent marketplace. You can see that it trended up a little bit in the last couple of years and, and Part of what you have to look at is whether we uh, at Berkshire are capturing every deal. I think Fidelity does a list where they think there's even more transactions if you're talking about um, very small um, transactions or practices, but in any event, it's picked up. The other thing you can see there is sort of the trend in, in valuation, and we tend to focus on multiples of EBITDA. And you can see that it, it sort of went up, it was high back in, um, in 2007, and it actually stayed reasonably high through the, the crisis, which might arguably make no sense. But to a certain degree, transactions were adjusted in terms of pricing to reflect some normalization of where people expected the businesses to, to operate, even if they were running below that at that point in time. Um, and then they, the multiples sort of dropped off a little bit as we came out of that, and again, in part because buyers probably were a little sensitive about whether the world was fully going to turn around, even as the businesses started to leverage off of the upturn in the market and their own new flows. And we saw that it, you know, the multiples started to run up a little bit um, towards the last couple of years. Um, right now, they're actually running relatively high as well. Um, I think that's again in part because of normalization where people expect things to come back. Um, I'd say one other aspect that has driven that to a certain degree is an evolution over time of a greater focus on ability to get uh, efficiencies in the marketplace. And that, you know, if I go back 20 years, most transactions in this industry were done based on the opportunity to grow and leverage the business or to, to increase it. Um, increasingly, as there is this consolidation, there's more of, can we cut out you know, expenses or the things we can do to be more efficient? And that ends up being some expense savings that uh, play into it. And so that tends to drive up the, the multiple to the seller. Um, from the buyer's perspective, the multiple is lower because they expect some of these efficiencies. The next slide, um, just try to give you a little bit of a sense of the mix of uh, players and transactions that are occurring. And so we tend to look at this in terms of wealth managers, traditional, which include most, you know, uh, the traditional mutual fund groups and then alternative products. And you can see that um, in terms of the number of transactions, wealth managers are um, almost always the most active sector, um, certainly in recent years. Uh, and there's been a lot going on in the alternative sector. In terms of the assets, it tends to be more the traditional and the alternatives that are the larger ones. The wealth management deals tend to be smaller. Um, that, that stands to reason. Um, in the upper right, we sort of try to give a little bit of a sense of the relative um, multiples. And while we, the previous slide gave you a sense of the, the medians, this gives you a little bit of sense of the volatility around that. So you can see sort of the, 
25% and 75% band there. But um, it's, you know, it, that's, it's been fairly consistent. I think people ask me on a fairly regular basis whether, you know, in difficult times whether their multiples come down dramatically and in, in good times would they go up. And there, there's certainly an element of, of higher evaluation in good times. Um, but these businesses have tended to trade at a fairly consistent range over time. So uh, worth considering. This slide gives you a little bit of a sense um, in terms of the, we view it as the, talked about the consolidation um, and a little bit what's going on. On the, on the right there, we have some of the examples of some of the players, all of which I'm sure you, you remember and, and can think about. It's just, there are a lot of different uh, players that have, have sort of consolidated over the years. And sometimes the, you know, one of the acquired firm is the name that carries on in the marketplace. It may be the more, um, better known name or the more logical name to carry forward. But there has been a fair amount of consolidation. I would say um, from my selfish perspective, thankfully people are constantly starting up new firms. <laughs> there, there seems to be an endless array of organizations out there, but these are some pretty major players that have um, traded and, and consolidated over the last few years. And we expect that to continue. And it's driven you know, by some of the things I mentioned on, on the first slide. Um, certainly cost increases play into this, um, fee compression does, you know, I think it's also, there's an element um, that plays into this as well that is related to the psychology of these firms. And we find that with a lot of the larger players, they struggle with um, the culture, the compensation arrangements, the ownership arrangements that are, you know, necessary in this. And so sometimes um, our sense is that certain large organizations that may have a fairly solid business just struggle with the ability to deal with the, the personalities involved here, with the, the special treatment that's often demanded to succeed. And that you know, firms that are focused on this, that are, have decided they're going to be in the business are better, better able to compete on that. So that, that's you know, a side aspect to this that it's hard to put a percentage on that, but I think that certainly, as you look at some of these players, you know, I, I look at uh, you know, Colonial First State, you know, a bank in Australia that I think struggled with some of the special compensation arrangements. They had problems themselves, um, but that, that has driven some of the change there, but that there are others like that as well. GE, you know, you can argue about all the reasons for that, but in part to, you know, to keep that separate from the rest of GE was something that they struggled with. Um, fee compression, th this slide gives a little bit of a sense of what's going on. And it's, you know, as I look at this and, and sort of walk through it, it's not like it's dramatic in one sense, but what's going on is that in most cases, other than active ETFs, fees over the last, you know, five, 10, and five, six years have been gradually coming down. And like I said, not, not huge, but if you're going from you know, in terms of the U.S. equity markets, you're coming down from 52 or so to 50 basis points on average. Um, not huge, but that coming basically off the bottom line when you think about it and in the context of the fact that expenses and other things are going up, it's just one more pressure point in the marketplace. So, um, you know, we watch that. Uh, you know, I've been thankful that it has been, frankly, less than some people argued it would be, but it is certainly... Um, a cost, it's certainly a factor in terms of driving some of the people to move towards exiting or selling. Um, next slide just relates to manager concentration in the fund business. Um, and again, no surprise to anyone, but this is another aspect of the business, certainly in the fund area, which we find um, causes some organizations to conclude that it's just, it's a tough fight. Uh, you know, the top uh, 10 managers in the fund business were you know, a very high percentage of the total back in 14, it's even higher as we go into 20. In the ETF, ETF market, um, frankly, you know, the top five have been very consistently large. It seems like actually some people are making a little progress there at the other end. So, uh, and there've been positive flows for ETF players in general, but it, it's, if you're not in the top five, it's, it's tough to break into that. And so um, we find that some of the groups just conclude they're not going to get there and, and look at um, what they what they ought to do. This slide um, 
probably shouldn't put it up. It's way too dense. But um, you know, there are a couple of things that I would take away from this. Um, certainly, there's been um, you know there's been a couple of areas of focus in terms of of acquisition searches and people trying to grow. And so one has certainly been you know focus on um, small cap or specialty types of products where there has been an ability to differentiate. So we've seen a number of searches and a number of transactions, you know, pursuing small cap managers. Um, there's been a high demand for fixed income. That's been an area that's had continuous interest throughout this uh, marketplace. And so whether it's in, you know, specialized credit types of managers, you can see a few of the transactions that have gone on there in terms of Blackstone or Brookfield diversifying or adding on to their already significant capabilities. Um, as well as you know, fixed income in there, we've seen actually quite a bit of interest in uni bond managers as an attractive um, segment of the marketplace. So things like that that are harder to index um, have been areas that have been um, a fairly attractive type of sector. Uh, we expect there'll be um, a fair amount of interest in global. Uh, there has been a you know, sort of continuing interest. There just haven't been that many that have been available. But you know that's an area that we expect there'll be um, activity in as well. So as I as I try to think about what you know, sort of the key aspects of, of this market and what they mean, um, you know, size, as I said, you know, I think is is fundamental in terms of this business. And uh, it used to be that I thought size was the enemy of a lot of um, these organizations, but. It's really the ability to withstand um, sort of the changes in the marketplace and to deal with the difficulties are important. Um, as I said before, the ability to attract and retain people is also a key factor in this. Um, and then we're also seeing that it is um, for a lot of them, the ability to control some of their expenses is an aspect that they benefit from in terms of, of size. Um, another aspect that you know is is important in all this is just uh, in terms of transactions, we're finding that it's it's difficult to do transactions when performance is weak. Um, you know, there's basically just a, a too much risk, um, certainly in the fund arena, but even on the institutional side, um, when performance is low to do transactions, it just wakes up you know clients who might be thinking about doing something to pursue it at that point in time. Um, so that's that's a, a consideration in terms of timing in this marketplace and in terms of the demand. Um, and then, you know, the the I guess the other aspect that we think about is um, what are the you know the the sort of metrics in terms of uh, valuation in terms of driving value and and in that certainly uh, growth has been a key factor. But at this point, it is also a fair amount of what sorts of um, ability is there to adjust expenses in these businesses. And whether that's, you know, cutting, cutting staff, whether that's leveraging your distribution, um, those are the sorts of things that a lot of the larger organizations are looking at fairly extensively as they look at, you know, how they pursue or how they consider doing acquisitions. So, you know, we expect that there's going to be um, sort of continuing activity in the sector, a lot of it, um, but, you know, I guess one of the things we're always looking for is there's something that's going to drive, you know, this activity. Um, and there's been consolidation for a long time. And is this going to, is there going to be something that's going to push everybody over the edge or not? And that continues to be, there's no bright line out there, but, you know, the pressure on people is causing, um, you know, people at various points in their career to continue to think about this. So it's an active market. Um, and you know, I have no reason to think that that's likely to change in the in the very near term. I have no reason to think that pricing is going to change dramatically in the near term. But you know, for each organization, they sort of come to their own conclusions about when they want to consider that. So I will um, stop the sharing and see if there are questions. Um, first, first question I have is: Did the acquisition of Oppenheimer by Invesco improve their competitiveness? Um, but you know, is, are they just a big, another big average firm? And, and you know, it, it's a very interesting point. Um, you know, part of the dynamic there, I think, was that um, Mass Mutual um, had, you know, concluded that they didn't want to really be in the um, equity side of the marketplace as much. They are focusing more of their attention on fixed and alternatives. 
And so they, I think part of it was driven by their interest in getting out. I think, you know, from Invesco's perspective, they've added a considerable amount of assets. Um, and so they've been able to leverage their platform a little bit more. Have they upgraded their, their skill set? I think they'd argue um, to some degree they've added some capabilities that perhaps they didn't have before. Um, but I, I, be, I wouldn't want to tell you that I think they've transformed their organization as a result of that. Um, yeah, question, how much has the limitation on travel had on global deals? Um, you know, I think it is, it's caused some slowdown. I, you know, I, I think in the context of our own business, you know, one of our partners in London was just very pleased we sold a real estate asset manager um, in Europe and that was done all virtually. Um, people never met. Um, on the other hand, um, I know we have several transactions and I know of others that don't involve us where people have put them on hold because um, they are sensitive about whether they can visit with people and, and understand, get a sense of the culture. And I, I, I've been wrong, um, first to admit it. Uh, I would have said, you know, six months ago that people won't do deals without meeting each other in person. And uh, that is clearly, I've been proven um, by our own firm as well as others that that is not necessarily true. I think there is a uh, preference for that. So I think, um, you know, we've had uh, people try to do uh, meetings. Uh, one of my clients is doing one today where they're meeting uh, socially distanced um, to try and accomplish that. But that tends to be domestic. Uh, the international side's a little harder to accomplish. So my sense is that um, there's an element of each of the different economies is reacting differently to the, the whole COVID event and, you know, what it's meant to their economies. But it's also, it has certainly slowed things down. I don't think it has put an end to it. Um, another question um, of what, what do I think about the advance um, merger and how that will play out? Um, uh, it's going to be interesting. I, I think part of this was probably driven by the fact that the senior management at uh, Eaton Vance, um, Tom Faust and Laurie were getting to a stage where they're both getting close to retirement. And so that probably played out a little bit. Um, and I think Brian Langstrat was not, I don't know whether he wants to run it or not. That's, that was the other question, but you know, Parametric will get an even bigger play at Morgan Stanley, which I think was the key reason that they wanted to buy into it. Uh, you know, I, I think Morgan Stanley has been pretty smart about how they've been transforming their business. And, you know, I, I came originally from a brokerage firm. And so I have probably a little bit of a cynicism about the brokerage mentality. But Morgan Stanley has, has taken some real steps to diversify their business and to build out their asset management business and seem to have left the organizations they've acquired um, not alone, but they've been supportive of them as opposed to interfering. And so, um, whereas I might've bet against them several years ago, I'd probably bet that they will do a good job of supporting that and, and helping that build out. Um, this question about um, how I'm defining alternative, uh, that's, a, that's a fair question and probably one we could spend a great part of the afternoon on. Um, but um, I would think, you know, part of that is just, we tend to think of it as um, ten, typically other sorts of non-public uh, market types of areas. Um, I tend to think of that as private equity, infrastructure management, um, real estate, um, hedge funds, I suppose, although they don't consider that as prominent in that sector anymore. You know, some of the special credit managers, the, the non-public credit managers. So things along those lines is, I guess, how I tend to think of it. I understand you could argue that there are other definitions around that. So um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, I guess, what are the consolidation trends for smaller boutique managers in contrast to the mega mergers? You know, that continues to go on. And I think there's um, a lot of um, interest in boutique managers. Um, and that comes from a variety of different channels. So you see some of the 
large organizations, I said, who are trying to add special capabilities. And so they look at um, whether it's, you know, specialty like small cap or other particular um, sector expertise. That's one of the ways that some of the larger firms are trying to differentiate themselves by having some specialty um, capabilities. So I think the demand for that um, remains prominent. Um, you know, there was, there has been a, a pretty strong uh, demand by some of the multi boutiques as well, AMG and you know, UAM, uh, Brightsphere, you know, was what were prominent in those. Several of the Australian organizations like Challenger um, were also prominent at that. Some of those have, have um, receded in the background. Brightsphere is, is basically breaking themselves up and like Mason's gone to um, Franklin Resources, obviously, but in their place, there's some others that um, are very much active in the marketplace. You can think of Dial and, and Peters Hill and some other groups like that. You can think of the, the, the wealth management firms, whether it's Focus or Hightower or and, you know, Cap Trust, things like that. And so I think the demand for some of the um, boutique managers remains pretty strong, but it is basically in the context of um, do they fit uh, a particular need for an organization and, and is their capability something that can be built upon um, or replace or, or sort of substitute for something that another organization either has and is doing poorly or would like to have in terms of adding on to their capabilities. Um, you know, I think one of the aspects for a lot of these organizations is the ability to um, keep their distribution forces um, and their distribution efforts um, supplied, if you will, with capability and product on a continuous basis. And while it, there, there's obviously a very strong argument for doing something that you do and doing it very well um, and not you know, distracting yourself with things that you can't do well, one of the aspects for some of the large organizations and Warren touched on the, the sort of distribution um, importance in, in these businesses is that you want to make sure you have something for your distribution, your sales force to constantly market. And, you know, there are times when even the best strategy may not be in, in vogue or not in demand uh, to the extent that something else is. And so having a range of products can be important. And so we find that uh, some of the larger organizations pursue or, or are interested in some of these boutique managers um, to add that capability and, and they sometimes need to move quickly to sort of address that. Another question, how long will the consolidation of wealth managers go? Um, are there reasons to think it will slow down or end? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. I, you know, it, it seems like there's um, an endless supply of these, uh, as I said before, part of what been reassuring to me through the years is that as we uh, worked on selling things and, and there were acquisitions in the industry, there seemed to be a constant supply of new ones and nowhere is that more apparent than in the wealth management sector where um, people leave some of the large brokerage firms or they leave banks or trust companies or they just uh, leave insurance companies and start up wealth businesses of various sorts. And so there's a constant supply of those. Um, I do think that as the marketplace is getting more competitive, as technology has made it easier to deliver some of the services on the, for the, the affluent as opposed to perhaps the very wealthy, um, that that is making it perhaps a little harder to break into some of these areas. And so I suspect that there's going to be a continued run at this and that some of the private equity money that is backing some of these roll-ups is going to see whether they can get large enough to go public um, and get out of the business in that way or sell to a larger player. That's generally the objective, it seems to me, of a lot of these private equity-backed groups. And if that keeps working, um, the consolidation will continue. If that starts to break down, my guess is that the capital that's been supporting a lot of this will start to, to dissipate uh, and will get down to a narrower set. Um, that, that, that's my, my guess. So thank you, Bruce.